Good afternoon. Uh, you are welcome to our next uh, conversation, next uh, roundtable speaking at the Scruton Cafe. Please come. Uh, as you know, uh, our guests are from the Salisbury Review, uh, Mary Cave and Alistair Miller, and uh, who will speak uh, about uh, with them, who will speak with them, and who will ask about very wisely and very smartly about uh, Roger Scruton is Professor Ferenc Hörher. So please uh, follow them, and uh, you can ask uh, many questions after the, their conversation. Thank you, Akos, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, being interested in this uh, roundtable. Uh, I'm uh, indeed uh, Ferenc Hörtjer, a research professor at the University of Public Service, and I guess the reason why uh, Scruton has invited me to, to uh, moderate this discussion is because I recently published a volume on Roger Scruton entitled Art and Politics in Roger Scruton's Conservative Philosophy. And I think this place is actually quite appropriate for uh, the discussion uh, uh, tonight, which is going to be about uh, Scruton and uh, the Salisbury Review and his uh, role in Central Europe. Why? Because, uh, as I understand it, it was part of uh, uh, this uh, uh, Samizdat movement uh, in Central Europe, as well as uh, kind of a Samizdat movement in Britain. And uh, funnily enough, uh, it remained the same story. So in a way, this uh, environment, which uh, resembles uh, something like those uh, underground university scenes where uh, Roger was... Uh, uh, giving his lectures and seminars uh, in Prague or in, uh, in Warsaw or uh, in Budapest in the late 70s and the, the 80s uh, resembles, at least that's the, that's the perception I have, this, uh, this uh, scenario that we have with a, with a pub outside where people are drinking and not uh, being aware that something serious is happening inside uh, just to, to let... Uh, the secret police and, and uh, the spies not knowing about uh, this uh, uh, kind of uh, talk. So it's, it's uh, quite interesting. And actually, my intention is to try to compare the two periods, the, 50, uh, the, the 80s uh, in, um, in Central Europe and in Britain and present day context. Of course, these are four different scenarios. The 80s, uh, the Thatcherite uh, Britain, uh, was one special context uh, for uh, Scruton establishing a Salisbury Review uh, in '82, uh, as uh, the 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 uh, editor in charge for this uh, uh, group, uh, the, the the Salisbury Group, and uh, and his role in Central Europe, uh, where he was. Uh, participating uh, in these um, flying universities or underground universities against the communist regimes. So apparently two different scenarios. But uh, as I understand it, uh, he did a uh, Salisbury Review as an underground venture in, in, uh, in, in Britain as well. And not only his role in, in Central Europe, but his role in, in, in Britain, in British culture, was kind of an underground activity. And uh, I have this uh, um, uh, quote uh, which might underline this fact uh, from his uh, uh, recollections of, of um, uh, the days when uh, uh, he was the editor. Although, uh, I quote him, although efforts to obtain funding were almost entirely unsuccessful, the dedicated work of our managing editor, Mary Cave, whose home became a Samizdat publishing house, ensured that we never got into debt. So, that was from the Spectator, I think, actually. Uh, yes, that's the Spectator yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. uh, recollections of, of him. Yeah. But it was uh, his own recollection. Yes, he, mm. he, his one uh, mm. is that. So it, it's here that he famously uh, recalled uh, this, uh, these years the following way. <coughs> Uh, this uh, this uh, editorship uh, costed him many thousand hours of unpaid labor, a hideous character assassination in private eye, three lawsuits, uh, two interrogations, one expulsion, the loss of a university career, 
uh, in Britain, unendingly contemptuous reviews, Tory suspicion and the hatred of decent mm. liberals everywhere. And it was worth, worth it. it. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've still got that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so Mary, c can you recall those years? You, you, of course, joined them in 1990, but uh, you surely... Uh, yes, I, I yes. joined, um, I suppose, in the summer of 1989. And um, can you hear me? Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. I, I don't like these things very much. I think I can enunciate. You can hear me at the back. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, in uh, 1989, the, uh, the wall was still there, and I was recalling um, to other people that uh, during the autumn, he was often instructing people who were going to Central Europe with some is that material, you know, like photocopiers or, or articles or books or, or what have you. And uh, I heard him telling one person a student he usually used, he usually used students for this work. And he said, if somebody follows you, don't be brave, just go back to the hotel immediately. And then it seemed a few weeks later, uh, the Berlin Wall came down. And just before that, uh, Jean, Gen Jan Gunagurski uh, was imprisoned for the umpteenth time. Uh, in Prague, and we were asked to pray for him. And then, as you know, the Berlin Wall came down uh, just before Christmas in 1989. Um, I have to correct what Roger said in, in that article, in that he, c he never got any money. That wasn't quite true. Um, the Salisbury, especially the father of the present one, did give quite a lot. Um, and that kept us going. And um, after... When he mentions 5,000 uh, uh, pounds first collected for the uh, publication. Yes, and then um, I went traveling in America and made a lot of um, American friends, including Russell Kirk, who had access to funds. And they were extremely generous. And it wasn't until 2008 that money from those various trusts actually dried up because of the banking crisis. And since that time, we've, uh, we've managed to float along thanks to the uh, contributions of uh, little people, you know, of subscribers and so on. But uh, very soon, we're going to relaunch the magazine because we think it's, uh, it needs invigorating. And the um, present or well, the past editor has retired because he's 82, and I'm nearly 87, so I must go. Alistair, of course, is a, is a stripling. He's very young still, so he'll be around for a long time. And um, so it's, it's, there's going to be a, a new look. For one thing, the new editor wants to put the Marquis back onto the cover. We've been having cartoons in the last 10 years or so. Um, is there anything else you'd like me to say yes, at this point? Yes, of course, because yeah. you, you gave us some data, but you did not uh, pronounce your, your uh, own uh, view on, on whether it was a Samizdat uh, publication and it remains one or not. Well, it's not a Samizdat publication because some, uh, we uh, had it in some bookshops. I mean, a Samizdat publication, so, uh, surely, is something that's passed around in secret. That's how I understand it. It is a bit but, um, I mean, some people uh, were a bit, uh, if they were worried about their lefty friends seeing it in the drawing room, they might have removed it, you know, if they didn't want to have a row. Uh, um, in that sense, it was Samizdat, yes. But also, not Samizdat uh, for Central Europe. After all, um, those uh, philosophy groups that um, Roger ran, and other people too, it, it was quite wide-ranging because there were a lot of Oxford philosophers like Iris Murdoch, who certainly was, le was left-wing. She wasn't right-wing. And so the master of Balliol was actually arrested in Czechoslovakia along with his wife. Um, you and they, Kenny? Yes, that's right. Um, I've forgotten his name now. Um, and they were driven to the border and just left in a field, you know? <laughs> 
And um, Norman Stone, of course, was another stalwart. Um, he was uh, arrested. I think a, Roger was arrested and not allowed to go back to, to Czechoslovakia. Yes, after, after he was arrested. Um, Norman Stone was imprisoned, I think, for three months. And during that time, there was a cellmate who was uh, a Hungarian Slovakian, and he taught him Hungarian. And uh, that is why uh, Norman Stone, um, with whom I'm sure you're familiar, because he lived, he lived here. Yeah, he lived here, yes. And he learnt, he was very good on Hungarian history. And he his, published a volume on Hungarian history. Yes, he did, but it was a very, quite a short one. And the Hungarian friends I knew at uh, that time were hoping that he'd do it in three volumes and it would be more. But the problem with uh, Norman is that he did like his um, his drinks, and um, he didn't. He wasn't as diligent as he should have been. It was a shame, but there you are. That, that's it. But he always wrote beautifully, and he was a lovely chap, um, Norman. I was always very fond of him. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe we can then now turn to, to, to Alistair, because uh, he seemed to agree with, with my judgment on, on on this uh, comparison between the some is that's here and some is that's there. Yes. How, how would that yes. spirit? I mean, I was in Prague in 1988 and we had a barbecue in the grounds of friends who had had a Samistat press, so their house was burned to the ground by the secret police. And so it was a very good place to have a barbecue. <laughs> uh, we would, no, so, so, so we didn't have anything like that. But um, uh, just um, two points about the 80s. That's right, Britain, this magazine was founded as a sort of antidote to Thatcherite conservatism, which was needed at the time, but it was very much a neoliberal markets, markets, markets. Margaret uh, Thatcher's hero was Hayek. Use the mic. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, Margaret Thatcher's hero was Hayek, who was the ultimate liberal, um, but very great thinker, but um, not really a traditional conservative as Roger Scruton would imagine in the tradition of Burke and Disraeli. Um, so, Although Hayek uh, uh, regarded himself as an old weed, which uh, yeah. is a distinction to, to yeah. like liberals, of course. Yeah. But, but you are right that, uh, that uh, Scruton tried to distinguish himself from what he called the free market years. Uh, yeah. and, and in that sense, he mm -hmm. wanted, represented uh, could, another tradition. Yes. Yeah, could I um, interpose at this moment to say that the Salisbury Review was founded, as I understood it, because uh, Margaret Thatcher placed too much emphasis on e economics mm. and not enough on social conservatism, social conservatism education yeah. and culture and so yeah. on. So, yes. And that, that was quite yeah. true. Um, I wouldn't agree about um, Friedrich Hayek. I mean, I've sat next to him and he, mm. I mean, the, the road to serfdom. Yeah. He said, oh, you know, sure. where we mm. were going in the 70s yeah. was the road to serfdom. Yeah. But, but, but I'm just thinking of. Uh, example in that book, it's a wonderful book, but there's no sense of society, there's no sense of, of um, traditions or of institutions or, uh, you know, um, customs, it's all the market will you know, leave it to the market. That's how, that's what I felt. I kept up, you know, well, I read a wonderful book, but, you know, um, of course, that was in the context of the Second World yes, War, yes, when the war yeah. economy, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, uh, mm. uh, promised something yes. uh, disastrous mm. for yeah. Britain itself. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, in, in his later work on the constitution of liberty, yeah. he, he mm. comes to uh, really um, focus yes. on, on institutions and, yes. and, and, and the role that institutions should play. I heard, um, yeah. I have to confess, I've never met Roger Scruton. I've, I've been written for the magazine for 15 years, and, and I quite often asked Mary, uh, I said I'd love to meet him, and she said, no, no, you wouldn't enjoy it, because he never says anything <laughs> to um, strangers. He d she meant he doesn't... He's doesn't got no small, small talk. talk. No small talk. He wasn't him. really interested so in talking him. to somebody who was his intellectual inferior, like me. Or me, yeah. You know, we did. <laughs> well, as long as I, I did I'm the... I'm sure that's somewhat of an As long as I was there to do the business and to uh, keep the thing going, you know, that's what I did. And I met very interesting people all over... We had people staying in our house after the wall came down to come and do training. It was paid for by our, our foreign office, 
um, and by the EU later. And uh, that's what I did. But you have to accept people as they are. We, we accepted sure, sure, Roger. Right. Yeah. Yes, and mm. You are certainly right that uh, mm. uh, Roger uh, he was a very, very aloof. special character. He was up there in the clouds, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I met him in, uh, I think it was in 1993, so it was already after the fall of the, um, the Iron Curtain. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I, I met him at the Collegium Budapest, which was just uh, then uh, established. And there uh, he was uh, one of a group of uh, philosophers and social scientists, and of course the, the only one uh, from the right, uh, as, as usual. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, you could distinguish him uh, yeah. quite easily yeah. from yeah. the others. But, uh, but I agree that he, he, he kept this uh, three uh, steps distance from, mm -hmm. from the people, uh, and, and, and that was part of his character. I, I always uh, explained it to myself that, well, that's part of his, uh, his Englishness. Uh, an English gentleman would not just you know, uh, talk to anyone um, just, just for fun. And, and in that sense, uh, I, I, I had no problem with it. Later, we, we got uh, quite uh, on good terms uh, uh, because uh, he knew my, my, my work and, uh, and, of course, because I, I uh, uh, admired his one. And uh, we had the opportunity to to talk on uh, the same uh, conferences, on the same sessions. So uh, he, he saw that uh, I took seriously some of uh, the things that he uh, found uh, crucial and and really important in in academic life. But but uh, yes, it's it's very interesting that that you have got these different uh, perceptions uh, that that. Uh, uh, you, you, Mary, say that it's it's unlike uh, 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 an Eastern European uh, uh, summit. That while while uh, as we heard, uh, 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 Scruton had this uh, perception, and of course he lost a lot uh, uh, by by uh, uh, publishing uh, this, uh, including his his career as a, an academic. Uh, uh, professor, although well, some others... Was, he was true yeah. to his last. He, he mm -hmm. sacrificed his career to being truthful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A lot of people have, uh, have not done that. They've gone along with it. Mm -hmm. um, and he should have had an Oxbridge chair. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah. he didn't. Can I just yeah. mention uh, sure. one of my favourite books, it, and it shows the man who's most brilliant, uh, is, I think it came out in about 1982, published by the Claridge Press, which he set up. Is that right? Yes. And it was called Thinkers of the New Left, mm -hmm. in which he um, analysed and demolished all the leading thinkers of the time, uh, people like Foucault and Sartre and Habermas, people like that. And, uh, and, and he'd read them all in French and German, he really knew their work, and he brilliantly analysed them and demolished them, but he made fun of them as well. And I think that he was never forgiven for that, that book, above, perhaps above all, that... Uh, finished his academic career in England. It's recently been reissued, and the new title is... Fools, Frauds. Fra and Firebrands. Fools, it. Firebrands, mm. meaning hotheads and frauds. Mm. Yes, it, um, it has been recently published into Hungarian, yes, I have to ad admit. Broad. And it's, it's, it's very nice book, but I also agree that, that it's sometimes it's, it's really nasty. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, it's very clever, very bright. Uh, uh, and it, it actually admits that these are, um, you know, uh, great figures of, of their own uh, kind. Uh, yeah. But uh, he, he is also uh, very, very. Uh, uh, but, the, but they were nasty. Those that's that's, also, true. that's Derrida, also true. That's also true. Wasn't Derrida the one who threw his wife down the stairs? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. But he didn't actually do Derrida in that book. But I think a few years later in his Guide to Modern Culture, he devoted a chapter to Derrida, mm -hmm. he called it The Devil's Work, mm -hmm. this absolutely brilliant analysis of Derrida and his project, it really is brilliant. On the other hand, uh, talking about this topic that we are talking today, uh, they together actually uh, fought against uh, communism in, in Central Europe in the 80s. Which is uh, uh, quite uh, quite an irony in, uh, in its own way. I mean, uh, Derrida, uh, Habermas, and Scruton uh, fighting uh, against yeah. communism. Mm -hmm. 
how, 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 would you, how would you address this issue? By, 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 I mean, in a certain way, it's, it's natural. Uh, he comes from a Cambridge context, and, and even uh, in those days, by, by those days, uh, Cambridge was full of, of leftist intellectuals, and, and uh, some of them were the ones who initiated this, this uh, approach uh, to, to the Central European countries beyond the Iron Curtain. Unfortunately, Derrida and Foucault and friends also <laughs> devoted themselves to destroying the Western cultural and moral inheritance. Um, and that, I think, was Scruton's <laughs> argument. And to this day, Derrida is a god in academia. You can quote him, you don't need to justify him. Well, by now it's not so much the case, but you are right that uh, at the turn of the century everyone was referring to him, and, and that's well, the same is. about Habermas, uh, uh, one in the German territory, the other one in the French-speaking uh, territory. He's in my field, uh, which is philosophy of education, for example. Yes. He is, you can quote Der Der Derrida. Is, you don't still, have to still acceptable. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. You don't have to justify Derrida uh -huh. or Foucault. That, you know, uh -huh. Foucault, that, you know, uh -huh. and... Uh -huh. Uh, yes. I had the impression that both of uh, these uh, French uh, guys, uh, by the end of the, their life, uh, b became uh, much more modest in, in their, their uh, political um, apprehensions, and, and also uh, a bit deeper in their philosophy. But I, I'm sure that, that, that you are right that uh, deconstructionism and uh, the sort of uh, structural analysis of, of, of theirs uh, indeed uh, was uh, very, very influential and also very destructive or subversive uh, as far as traditional educational ideas are concerned. But uh, in its own way, these uh, summits that uh, universities wanted uh, to, uh, to make it possible for, for Eastern European or Central Europeans, as we prefer to call ourselves, uh, uh, students and philosophers, uh, to, to get in touch uh, with, with Western culture as they understood it. And that was, uh, of course, an idealized Western uh, um, uh, culture. So uh, what do you think about the educational uh, relevance of that sort of um, activity that he uh, um, uh, tried to take part in in the 80s, uh, going to uh, these uh, totalitarian states and trying to address ordinary people um, um, and, uh, and um, the high intellectuals of the day who did not agree with the, the system. Of course, the three scenarios, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, as they, it was called in those days, Poland and Hungary were very different, but, uh, but uh, apparently he, got, uh, uh, he had a mission, uh, as he understood it, to go there and try to, to, to help them and present uh, ideas for them uh, against uh, communism. Well, he set up um, special uh, societies in, in each country. The Jan Hus uh, Foundation the Jan Hus and, and the Jagalo, um, um, Jagalonian uh, in Poland uh, yes. and the, what was it in Hungary? Well, in Hungary, un unfortunately, it was the Soros Foundation. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> well, oh, Soros yes. was quite good then, wasn't he? I mean, yes, well, he was yes well against the communists, it was quite reliable. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, he, we know about Soros, I mean, uh -huh. he's just changed. Sure. Um, no, no, but, I, um, he, he, he remained, <laughs> the, the world changed, and therefore his position in the world uh, uh, changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. But in, indeed, uh, it was uh, through Shorosh uh, scholarship that I got a, a possibility to, to study in, in Oxford in 87, 88. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I, I would not uh, uh, dare to say anything against him in, the, in that context, which was the context of totalitarian regimes and the Iron Curtain in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all these foundations uh, were a, a, a place for um, a focus for, for the underground universities. <laughs> and um, how much filtered down to the ordinary people in the countries, I, I don't know. Um, it was mainly to, to the intellectuals who publicly um, fought fought the regimes and had to become firemen or um, boiler stokers. I mean, most of them were all stripped of their professional uh, jobs, weren't they? Yes, that's very interesting that there were differences and, and, and Roger was well aware of those differences between the countries. 
uh, we have got these uh, recollections of those years uh, in, uh, in his uh, interview in the Hungary Today uh, from uh, 2017. And there he says that uh, he was uh, uh, quite on friendly terms with uh, people like Janos Kis, uh, Miklos Harasti, or Gabor Demski here in Hungary, mm -hmm. who all mm -hmm. of them became uh, politicians uh, uh, of um, the, the left liberal coalition later. Uh, Gabor Demski becoming um, uh, the mayor of uh, Budapest. Mm -hmm. But he also added that uh, this, wa this was uh, uh, not really the sort of underground culture that he found in Prague mm. and, and uh, not comparable to Solidarność. This is what he says. There wasn't a real underground culture here, such, such as there was in the Czech lands, mm. and which I have described in Notes from Underground. That's the novel that he writes about yes, his years yes. in, mm. in, uh, in the Prague. There were some highly eccentric people like Tomasz Goji, <laughs> it's misspelled mis, uh, here, but uh, that's uh, uh, Miklos Tomasz Gaspar, who recently died a philosopher, uh, and, and uh, Roger was the, the, the godfather of, of uh, his later, uh, his, his uh, 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 older uh, uh, daughter, uh, and uh, Tomasz Goji in those days was uh, a conservative, so they were on friendly terms with each other. But uh, he calls him a highly eccentric pe uh, man, and Tomasz Gozzi, when, when Roger died, uh, wrote um, an obituary, and uh, there he said that, well, we were friends, but then uh, this man uh, got mad and, and homophobic and all that, because in the same time, Tomasz Gozzi became uh, 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 a Marxist again, a very uh, uh, well uh, <laughs> explicitly uh, uh, a Marxist uh, philosopher. So he is not really uh, uh, satisfied with the Budapest con uh, context. What uh, he found in, in, in Prague was uh, a real uh, moral issue, that you w want to uh, support people who uh, do not have opportunities and who are left out of this European uh, common cultural tradition. So, and, and now I, I would like, Alistair, to, uh, to hear your views, because you are in, in the theory and, and, and history of education. How do you see that, uh, is there a need uh, for that uh, even today? And perhaps now uh, people should go to the West to do the same sort of uh, uh, ex exercise? I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a huge problem in Western academia, certainly in Britain, and it's um, very extreme. I, um, I've written quite a few article uh, papers for a, a philosophical journal uh, on education, and I would never use the word conservative, for example, except in a derogatory way. If I used it in a positive, it would be out. It would, you know, that, you know, this is fascist. And that's how it is. So I only get things published because I pretend to be a social justice warrior and gently subvert some of the standard orthodoxies. Um, so that's how it is. And I think that's why widespread in academia. You see, you, you've heard about people being cancelled, and it's, it, that's how it is. It really is a, um, it, it's very difficult. Uh, um, Nigel Bigger in Oxford recently, he dared, uh, who's a professor of history and theology, I think, he, he dared to write a book about the British Empire, suggesting that there were positive aspects to it, and it created a terrible outrage. And he should be cancelled. He should well, he should lose his job and argue with him, but he that he should lose his post and cause real outrage. You know, how can this person be a professor? It's it, it's that, that's how it is in Western academia. It's, yes. it's very worrying. In a way, uh, Central Europe has more freedom of thought than yeah. in England and America. Well, the UK and America. And why do you think it, it's the case? Well, one of the reasons is that we've, we've always had free speech and we didn't value it. And now the left are, uh, are on the ascendant culturally and uh, are on the way to depriving us of it. Hmm. We've never been up against it except in the, uh, in the war when we had bombs over our head, but we were not occupied. I mean, you think of the history of Hungary 
Um, people still remember 1848, don't they, when the Russians came to finish the revolution? Uh, 1848, but, uh, but 1956, we yeah, know. Yeah, well, <laughs> 1956, even yeah. more. Yeah. So, yeah, but they yeah. do. I mean, uh, we were out, I was out with somebody who showed, showed me the 1848 cost of mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. statue. Yeah, that's yeah. true, that's true. Yeah, that, yeah. That, mm. uh, no, you're very aware of your troubled history because you're not an island like we are. You know, borders are important. That's, that's, that's for sure. That I, I, I think that's mm -hmm. why people in Europe value freedom more than we do. Would you agree? Potentially, but I, wouldn't, I, I would draw the line between East and West again. And I would suggest that if we look to the West, it's not only Britain, obviously with Virgin, Virgin, by virtue of being an island, but other countries towards the West, you look at the Germans, they've forgotten all about the idea of freedom. And you sort of say that's interesting. I apologize, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Uh, people are here to discuss it. Yeah, I know, but you, I thought maybe you would want to open it to the floor. You know, yeah, so I open it to the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In retrospect, you're yeah. no, I, I think there is a big um, the way I see it, I see that uh, I'm continually reminded that there have, been there have been suggestions that potentially we need a new cultural Berlin Wall, um, it, not to protect the West from the East, but rather to protect what we now have and which, that which the West has now lost. Yes. Um, so I don't see it necessarily in terms of Britain. Okay, Britain is a case on its own. It's, it's an island. It's totally different history. But like I said, if you looked at the Germans, the German history, even in the 20th century, you sort of say, well, they, they know occupation. Surely they, they understand the importance of freedom, but they don't. Here you have the Germans being very, acting very, very strangely, and they're saying, we will accept all Muslims and all Africans because everybody is our brother. And you say, but what about those who who were living on the other side of the wall, who were actually your genetic brothers and sisters, and say, no, we still look down on them. We still refer to them as, oh, the Easterners. So you've got this odd situation which has occurred, somehow has to develop... I wouldn't have included Germany. In Possibly. You know, I, I wouldn't have included Germany in Central, what I was saying about Central Europe. No. Germany is a special case. Yeah. And, you know, they have this thing about guilt. Unseen. True, and but they can't get over they, it. No, they can't get over it. Mm. But in terms of uh, freedom of speech, I think the Germans, essentially, we can draw the line where the old Berlin Wall used to be, in that we appreciate it over here, and as you said, the West have not oh, noticed that it's, be, it's, it's gone. It's mm. been diminished over the past 30, 40 years, with nobody really bothering to care. But, but it's easy to understand it from the left's perspective, because they are progressivists and they want to progress further and further. What is uh, harder, perhaps, to understand um, from uh, this side of uh, the Iron Curtain, uh, the, the earlier Iron Curtain, is uh, the liberals. Why do they um, forget about their own uh, primary oh, principles, yeah. which is freedom of press, freedom of expression, freedom of thought, academic freedom, freedom of religion. This, these are um, b major uh, uh, classical liberal values, and they, seem to, uh, they yeah. seem to forget about it. How, how would you explain that? This cultural revolution that we've had, I think classical liberalism has morphed into something quite different, a sort of radical, egalitarian, multicultural liberalism yes. under the influence of a lot of these post-Marxist thinkers. Um, so, it, so the nation state is fascist and you know, we, um, we need open borders and so on. And um, how, why that's happened, uh, there's a sense in which liberalism does contain the seeds of its own destruction. Um, it's a very complex matter, but uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and of course Roger Scruton's defense of the nation state is absolutely magnificent. But even in his later books, um, Roger Scruton steered clear, didn't touch multiculture, he was careful. I think, I think he maybe thought, well, we, we just have to do our best now. We've lost our, the, the sense of an inherited English civilization, which he loved, 
you saw we just have to try to make the best of having British Pakistanis, British Nigerians, and so on, um, who might share territorial loyalty and somehow we could make a new British identity. I think it's very optimistic. I don't know whether he really believed that. Um, oh, oh, even, even more, uh, perhaps uh, there is a contradiction already in his defense of the nation state. Uh, I wonder how, how, how you see it, but, yeah. but uh, when I read uh, you know, British authors, they always regarded uh, Britain as something more than a nation, a nation state. Uh, they regarded as, it as a kind of a, a, a monarchy, uh, which is uh, you know, a combination of nations living together under mm -hmm. uh, a unified uh, st structure, under uh, the, the sure, crown yeah. of, of the British monarch. Well, that is, that is the union, and that, of course, is under fire at the moment. Uh -huh. with the scotch and the but, although but, I'm hoping that that might blow over but I don't know but I'm not won't live to see it anyway so. they don't have the support so no. fingers crossed yeah I, I think mm. in the past though Britain um, England and Britain were used interchangeably Britain was basically England projected overseas and so that's why until the 1960s we had English history English history um, some, and then quietly it morphed into British history, but English history was the history of the English people, and that was the dominant story of Britain. And of course the Scots and the Welsh... So it was not a national history, it was the, the history of the British uh, people. The English people. Uh, of um, the English well, people. Well, I wouldn't ex I, uh, agree about that. I was, we were always, um, in uh, the textbooks at school that I used, there was always the the Scotch bit, yeah. and the Irish bit, mm -hmm. and the Welsh bit sometimes, you know. I, d I didn't have that experience, you know, that but it was too English-centric yeah. at all. I think what's happened now is that British history, uh, the, the idea of Britishness, of British identity, it means multiculture. Mm -hmm. It means multiculture, and, and this is what's happened. Okay, uh, so uh, Britain has its own uh, um, dilemmas and... and, and uh, of course, Brexit uh, uh, caused a, a huge uh, difference in, in the political possibilities and the framework itself. And um, it is well known that, uh, that Roger um, um, supported uh, um, exit. Uh, um, uh, and, and he, uh, in fact, uh, suggested to Central European countries not to join the European mm -hmm. Union. I uh, suggested that to a group of, a pol um, of Hungarian MPs in 1993. Uh -huh. When I first came to Hungary, I met some um, young members of Fidesz who invited me and my husband to come and talk to them. Um, they were very charming to us. And they said, you're going to talk to uh, some Hungarian MPs to this evening. I said, well, you know, but anyway, that's what I told them. That was the gist of my little talk. Mm -hmm. And well, how did they receive it? What did they re respond? Well, they were rather rather sceptical. They did think it would be the way forward. Mm -hmm. That was the impression. Mm -hmm. Some of them agreed. With of course, them. in 1993, uh, Fidesz was quite close to the, 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 the liberals. And uh, and uh, was on the, in the m movement from from that uh, liberal uh, perspective to uh, becoming uh, the major right wing party uh, after 1994, the, the fall of the first uh, Hungarian uh, coalition uh, government, which was a, a right wing, uh, well, uh, partly uh, national, uh, partly Christian democratic uh, uh, coalition, but uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it, it was uh, just uh, our illusions or idealism. What do you think? Uh, because uh, by now, uh, a lot of uh, politicians uh, have uh, skeptical views on the European Union. On the other hand, uh, as far as I know, still the majority of Hungarians would like uh, to stay within the, the Union. Oh. Lots and lots of French people can't stand the EU. Mm -hmm. 
What does so. Victor Orban think about the EU? Really, would he would he leave? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> apparently not, because if he would, uh, he he did. So, uh, so I I guess uh, not. Uh, but uh, of course, he left uh, uh, this uh, this uh, major European uh, party, uh, which was the the centre right uh, party, the European People's Party. And now he is alone uh, in, in uh, I mean, uh, Fidesz is, uh, is alone in the European Parliament, which is, of course, not a strong position. So in, in a way, uh, it, that's, that's really a challenge for him, uh, too. Mm. I have mixed feelings about Brexit. First of all, it's a tragedy that the EU, uh, in, in a sense, was founded to erase national histories. And the Charter, I think, makes no mention of our Christian traditions. It was to erase national borders and national cultures and um, so the EU is a great advocate of course of multiculture and um, diversity and um, it's not very keen on our Christian traditions. Uh, Cardinal um, Pope Benedict when he was Cardinal Ratzinger wrote a wonderful book um, he was talking with an Italian humanist professor um, about and it, about this and they called the book Without Roots and it was a wonderful um, critique of the EU for, for repudiating its tradition. So I think that's, uh, whereas an EU of nation states would be very attractive. The other problem with it is, is that Britain leaving the EU, we have, we have a slogan, Global Britain, but what does that mean? It, it seems to mean in practice open borders, mass immigration and selling off all our national assets to and that's what it seems to me and I'm not sure that's such a wonderful thing so I've from uh, from a central European position uh, perspective uh, uh, in fact uh, the, the leave of, of uh, Britain is a, a real loss uh, also, uh, yes. because uh, of course we, we lost a, a major ally yes. uh, yes. or at least a potential yes. ally for, for the, the, the Central European position, which is a position of uh, yeah. a, a Europe of nations, of course. Mm -hmm. I think in, yeah. in this, the Visegrad countries uh, all agree that, that what they want is, is, uh, is uh, more uh, uh, a Europe of nations than this. Possibly uh, Denmark is another country that would have wanted mm -hmm. a Europe of nations, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in in that sense, uh, there are um, there are open questions, but uh, but of course, uh, uh, Roger seems to be quite uh, radical uh, for for mm -hmm. for Brexit, uh, and and uh, in a way he, he kept that uh, mm -hmm. that uh, position. Now perhaps uh, we could uh, say a few things about uh, uh, his views on art and culture and uh, the role art and culture plays uh, in politics, because apparently uh, he was also an artist. Uh, he, he wrote novels, he wrote uh, operas, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he had a fascination with, with uh, Central European culture. Now, how do you explain that? What, what do you think makes uh, uh, an English uh, uh, professor interested in Central European art and culture? Well, he was always interested in, in Central Europe. Uh, why? Even, why? Mm -hmm. Well, because he was a polymath and he could, he could pick up a language very quickly. So why like not uh, the Islamic countries or the uh, Far Eastern countries well, or whatever? Well, he, because he, he was for the European tradition rather than the, the Islamic one. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he did, I think he did try to learn Arab at one time, Arabic at one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, no, he was obviously fascinated, as I was, by... Mm -hmm. Uh, Central Europe. Uh, I did it through history. He did. I don't know how he he came to be so. Uh, but I, I think it was through the persecution of um, intellectuals in um, in Central Central Europe. I, mean, I never asked him because I never had any meaningful conversations with him really <laughs> about how he came to. Uh, this is a wound to, that you to, have to, got to, deep enough, yeah, uh, apparently. To, to this. Um, to, to embrace, um, I, th I think he was a cold warrior like me, uh -huh. and you know I had read something um, written by a Russian. I chose freedom. Uh -huh. uh, Viktor Kravchenko. He was actually assassinated by the KGB in Paris, eventually. But I read this when I was twelve, and ever since, you know, and he might have done the same thing. Who knows? You know? mm -hmm. uh, same sort of. Uh, feeling that half of 
Europe, which is our civilization, and that's what matters. Mm -hmm. The civilization, the cathedrals, the books, mm -hmm. the languages, the art, the music, etc. And that civilization had been cut in half by the Soviets because we couldn't go to all those places mm -hmm. in Poland and that my forebears had been able to visit. Mm -hmm. They were off limits and it was um, there was a wire all mm -hmm. the way around it. Now can I can I ask a sensitive issue here? You say that the, it's the Soviets who cut uh, the country into two, but uh, as far as I remember from my historical studies, um, Churchill had something to do with that as well. Uh, the, I mean the, the percentage uh, agreement, of course. And uh, I wonder how, how you see it, because on the other hand, it was Churchill who was, uh, of course, the, the major voice uh, starting uh, this 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 anti-communist uh, oh, yes. uh, discourse. Oh yes, but I mean, he, he he was. But was it not because of his sense of guilt, he, perhaps? Well, how could he stop the Americans being seduced into letting the um, the Soviets into Berlin? Mm -hmm. That was that was the problem. He wasn't in the incendent. Franklin Roosevelt was. Not he. But they and say that if don't he went from the, from the State from the Department, South, uh, don't forget the State Department mm -hmm. in America was full of communists, mm -hmm. all plotting away. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, poor Churchill was the um, the weaker member of of the. Mm -hmm. That that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And then Roosevelt died, of course, and we had Truman, who was um, a great character and a good, uh, great president in my. But it was too late mm -hmm. to stop the division of Europe. Um, but um, we did stop communism in Greece mm -hmm. by supporting the uh, the status quo in, in in the Greek civil war. Otherwise, Greek uh, Greece would have gone down. Uh, so I, I don't think you can blame Churchill for that because he was a junior member of the big three. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm. Uh, Alistair, what's your... I was just going to say that, um, that, that there was a sense, I certainly I felt it when, when I visited Czechoslovakia, stayed there before the revolution, and um, that in a strange way under communism, some of the old European culture was actually preserved living culture um, in a way it wasn't in the West. And I think Roger Scruton said that in one of his mm. books, it was a strange feeling that, um, I mean, I met the best people there who were better educated than anyone I'd ever met in my country. And I spoke to many uh, people in England said the same thing, you know, people who were better educated, um, more, um, um, in classical languages and this sort of more cultivate, better educated. Mm -hmm. Some of these things have been kept alive in a way mm -hmm. they often weren't. Well, we've West. often commented on this, uh, mm -hmm. this Music, of, uh, example, uh, um, yeah. haven't we, both yeah. of us, that in a way um, certain old European values were uh, kept alive um, if, if you can withstand the, the communist governments in a way that the old European values were not kept alive in Western Europe. Mm -hmm. And there is a very interesting book uh, on this called The Death of Old Europe, which was by, a t a t um, he's called Bassett, it's well worth reading. Mm -hmm. And it's in a, in a paperback now. And uh, he was the Times correspondent in the last years of the communist regimes. Um, and he, before, the, when he was reporting for the Times, He'd stayed with old aristocrats in Trieste, in Zagreb, you know, as a lodger because they were always running out of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, I think, um, and he made this. Well, the whole um, book was about the title, "The Death of Old Europe," that the, <coughs> in a this peculiar way, liberation had brought brought about. Uh, uh, brought the death even closer. Mm -hmm. Communism, because nobody could afford to um, pull down old buildings and put up horrible new ones. Mm -hmm. You didn't have the brutalism that we've had in the West, for instance. Um, I, stayed, I, I yeah. stayed with a, a Czech physicist mm. and his family, and uh, he 
his family used to have musical evenings. Mm -hmm. which they would all play, and his hobby was teaching Latin and Greek. Mm. That was his hobby, and I thought. Well, yes, well, you see, <laughs> people wouldn't <laughs> want people wouldn't want to watch television because it would be, all be <laughs> rather boring, and so it was much better to have a musical evening like we used to in, during the war or or before. Yeah. I did say mm -hmm. to someone, I said, I'm impressed. Away, everyone seemed to know. It's quoting from Plato and. Aristotle, and, and he said, yeah, 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 that's because we weren't allowed to read anything, any philosophy after Plato and Aristotle. I don't know if that was really Except for Marx or Engels. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, so maybe we can uh, ask our um, um, audience if they have got any questions uh, or comments. Who, who has got anything to add to that? Please. Uh, the, the first is, uh, you briefly addressed what Roger Scruton's attitude towards uh, immigration and integration in Britain was. I, I actually attended a talk that he gave in London in, in 2015 where he spoke about this in part. And he made an interesting comment because he said that he thought uh, Christians, of course, from uh, non-European countries uh, could develop a British identity, but he also thought Hindus from India could because uh, uh, he thought that the polytheistic nature of Hinduism lent itself to them being open, more open to adopting traditions and values from other cultures. I'm, I'm not sure if I agree, maybe, maybe he's right about that, but he, he was quite clear about the fact that he was very skeptical that uh, Islam could ever no. be successfully yeah, integrated. Yeah, so that was his comment on that. Mm. But uh, my question is, uh, I'm just curious about how uh, the sorts of ideas that Roger Scruton and, and others uh, brought to uh, the other side of the Iron Curtain during this period were received because uh, I'm American and I, w I was a university student in Michigan uh, in, the, in the early 1990s and uh, I met a number of, of uh, students who were just coming from countries like uh, Hungary and Russia, Poland, uh, who were studying, uh, you know, in many cases for the first time in many decades at an American university. But they were not very interested in the idea of identity or preserving identity or adopt, you know, preserving values, Christian values, traditional values. They envisioned it that. Uh, the Eastern Europe was just going to adopt American values and lifestyle and Western European ideas and lifestyle, and then everything would be would be wonderful. Uh, I would think today, you know, like like here in Hungary, uh, uh, with the current regime, that uh, people would be more open to this idea. But but what was the response of uh, you know sort of these these uh, the British conservative tradition in the Eastern Bloc at that time? One, one small thing related to that was um, um, Roger Scruton, one thing he said was that what people loved was the Salisbury Review. Even if they disagreed with things that were written in it, they, it was written in plain, ordinary language where words had meaning. And it was quite different to the Stalinist news news speak, Orwellian news speak that they were used to, and that, and that was so refreshing. And uh, that sounds was quite interesting, that it was, you know, and that, 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 that in itself was. was well, when my but, friend uh, uh, first visited uh, Czechoslovakia, they went round a few classrooms and found the Salisbury Review used as teaching materials. This was after the liberation, of course. Yeah. Mm. And how about the question that the gentleman asked? Oh. <laughs> Goodness. Um. You have to repeat it because I'm not quite sure what you meant. Well, just what... Forgive me. Yeah. Um, what the response of those people who were exposed to ideas such as, as those in the Salisbury Review was at that time, either in, in England or in in, uh, in Central Europe. Uh, in in Central Europe, in you know the parts behind the the, I don't know. the wall. Do you know well, um, I think 
Wasn't we, we, I mean, it, it was only, only the, uh, the dissidents who read the Salisbury Review. It, it wasn't allowed to be. Uh, but that's I mean, the 80s. I think the question was yeah. the 90s already. Well, yes, also into, into the 90s after uh, it I became mean, possible I mean, uh, to... Uh, definitely, of course, uh, uh, youngsters had these, uh, these uh, ideas that they want to, to go to good universities in the West and become, you know, westernized and, and, and have uh, Western salaries and have Western yeah, ways yeah, of life. Yeah. That, that's quite natural and obvious, I would say. And in that sense, uh, that was n not a problem. The problem was that as soon as the West uh, started to forget yeah. about its yeah. own identity, what happens right. then yeah. with, with the, the Eastern European st students and youngsters? And the problem is that uh, by now, Eastern uh, European uh, generations, young generations, uh, got uh, absolutely uh, disinterested uh, in, in the politics in many ways, partly because they are not really addressed by either sides, uh, yeah. and, and partly yeah. because, yeah. of course, they are pragmatic, and uh, what they want is a uh, good salary and, and, uh, and a modest, uh, decent way of life, uh, which is quite natural. But then I, I think that uh, that politics uh, should address these uh, these uh, generations uh, on both sides of of uh, of, of Europe, uh, and and uh, and maybe uh, a lot depends on these generations because they will soon uh, uh, determine the yeah. fate of this continent. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, of course, this coincided with uh, the um, continuous decline of religion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and church going. That's that's true. Uh, secularization, mm. Yeah. Mm. and and it's very interesting and and um, quite uh, uh, explicit that uh, after the fall of the Iron Curtain came the fall of religion in in in, in countries like Poland or, or Hungary yeah. as well, yeah. which is uh, which is uh, uh, mm. you know a very difficult thing to address because uh, no one wants to introduce uh, communism in order to, to, to gain, uh, you know, uh, church believers, uh, the quantity of mm -hmm. church believers. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, yes, the fact is that as a result of the openness, uh, mm -hmm. there is a decline in, in, in religious uh, uh, enthusiasm and, and, and uh, in, in, in traditional ways of life. Uh, yeah, that's, and that's true. Uh, I... I get the impression that um, youngsters in in uh, all these uh, Central European countries uh, were now exposed to things I don't like, like pop music and loudness and extremism and um, well, completely non-traditional ways of life. That's for yeah. sure. And yeah. and what's 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 to be done here? Oh, it's too late <laughs> to do anything. Just a very interesting yes. uh, example that uh, Ceausescu, who was revered in, in the West, and he received a lot more than simple um, protocol, acts of protocol and uh, acts of courtesy diplomatically uh, for decades mm? s yeah. by running yeah. the most barbaric uh, regime one could it imagine it paralleled yes, Stalin, yeah. but he made very good use of, um, he, he struck a chord with, with nationalism and uh, also orthodoxy, orthodox Christianity. So that, uh, that is interesting, that how uh, totalitarianism, uh, this Ceausescu's version of uh, communism um, was uh, so well received in the West for decades. I know that there were uh, obviously uh, Cold War <laughs> considerations behind oh, that, yeah. but you could you could go beyond. I think you could go beyond that. That's one thing. And uh, your magazine, the Salisbury Review, published uh, an article I think in '82 by Ray Honeyford on uh, mm. multiculturalism and the crisis of uh, of the impending crisis that uh, unaddressed multiculturalism will cause in your schools, and that's uh, happened now, I think. It's probably irrever yes. it's yeah. irreversible. Uh, Catherine Burbal Singh, who you might know of, is coming to Hungary in a couple of days, and she has a lot to say about that. Uh, she has been struck off uh, the uh, Social Mobility Commission for uh, her views on uh, multiculturalism. 
Who's that? Uh, she is the former head of the Social Mobility Commission in the UK. Who, uh, What's the name? Castrin uh, Burbo Singh. Oh, you, yes, I'm sure you. I'm yeah, sure you will know about her. Catherine Burbo Singh, because she has set up some excellent schools, and my granddaughter goes to one of them in Oxford. So that's um, that. That's but, what I'm talking um, about. You, you know, anybody who rises above all this is put down. So would you say that it was that foreseeable four, yes. four decades yes, ago that this is going to happen? Yeah, the, schools are, the schools that she set up are still going, fortunately. And they, are, they have very strict discipline. And so, you know, me as a grandparent and her parents are very pleased to send our child in Oxford to this uh, school. Uh, and she set up some uh, another s well. It's a there are about five schools in something called the River Trust. But she's written a lot of articles, um, and of course she can she she can say anything because she is uh, black or she's got frizzy hair. But even she, as you say, has been demoted. She's no longer this uh, czar, as they called her. Catherine yeah. Um, uh, I think the vital thing is that um, that a, um, that values, all values, customs, norms are mediated through a tradition. Um, at least this is the conservative view. You need them, and that has to be transmitted to the next generation. And um, that's the that's the great educational issue and we're not doing it in Britain and I think it's be, it's happening in Hungary to some extent you are managing to at least transmit something of Hungarian history traditions and so forth although well, there are huge debates nowadays about uh, secondary education and primary education here in the country because uh, uh, teachers like you yourself uh, feel that they are underpaid and under honored uh, mm. uh, by the general public and Same by the state. I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but then I don't deserve to be honored. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've known so many good teachers leave the profession, like Ray Honeyford. I mean, he was no racist. He he loved his little Asian boys, as he called them. He was a friend of mine and a friend of ours, when my husband was alive. Um, and um, all, he, he was uh, <coughs> sacked by his local council because he'd written this article in the Salisbury Review about the difficulties of um, teaching Asian children when the parents insisted on going for holidays in the middle of the year, you know, during term time, <laughs> which, you know, the English children wouldn't have been allowed to do that, to go away for a month or two. <laughs> uh, something else about Roger Scruton's conservatism is a belief in high culture, that there is a hierarchy. Not all um, music is at the same level, not all dance. He really believed in, in the idea of high culture. And um, that's something that um, the greatest conservative thinker in the English-speaking world of the last hundred years, according to Roger Scruton and many others, T. S. Eliot passionately argued, and it's absolute heresy to say this now. He believed in a what he called a healthily stratified society that it wasn't bad to have elites, um, and and if you didn't, if you if you you know if you have a complete egalitarian, perfectly liberal society, that's fine. But you're not going to get culture. You're not going. Everything is going to be reduced. To the lowest denominator, well, yeah, right? and high, and and that leads on to what's happening in Britain now. Uh, high culture, well, it's it's white, it's male, it's European, um, so it's you know um, uh, this is what's happening. Uh, uh, last week, uh, recent weeks, the English National Opera, to give an example, one of our two great opera companies has been had its funding halved. And it's been asked to leave the London Coliseum a great theatre in London, get out, it's got to go into start touring because its audience is not diverse enough. 
for example, the wrong people are coming to see the opera. Don't forget that so it's sword, being cancelled. Don't forget that sword crime is a reality now in Britain. And I the BBC think, singers, uh, yeah, with uh, with praying silent, you can get arrested and mm. uh, interrogated for yeah. silently praying uh, in the vicinity yeah. of an abortion clinic in modern day oh, wow. Britain. So yeah. that, I would say, marks the, the end of mm. the UK as a free society. Andrew Tettenborn wrote an article about yes. that very recently. I recommend it to you. Pardon? Where do you live? Well, uh, in the vicinity of the capital, 55 kilometers. Oh, here? Yes. Oh, yeah. But you, you know all about Britain, it seems. You must be a, <laughs> a frequent visitor. In, uh, I visited uh, in September, but before yeah. that I hadn't visited for mm. the decade and a half. Mm. Yes, the elegy of England. That's that's what we have here, and I think that's that's, oh, that's the one of England the England and elegy. That's right. It? That's yeah. that's mm. uh, that's the one of the nice uh, books of of uh, Roger Scruton about this situation. It's very mm. pessimistic. Though, it's mm. it's very pessimistic, and it's it might be our final note for today. <laughs> just uh, that to be in tune with with that uh, feeling. But I think that uh, as long as we are uh, going to discuss this, uh, it's it's still. Uh, uh, not the end of the story, so I think that we should uh, keep on talking about this and uh, discussing it and writing about it and uh, and uh, do it uh, cross borders. So I mm -hmm. appreciate that you came and, and shared with us your your memories and, and views on that. And, uh, and I'm also very grateful that you are interested in this uh, sphere of the world and, and, and uh, our uh, cultural traditions. Uh, and uh, and let's hope that uh, it's going to mm. to continue. So yeah, well, uh, I I've, wish I've all always the best for yeah. the Salisbury review. Thank thank you very much, and okay. uh, we shall, of course, continue to send you the Salisbury review, we and uh, let you, you know how we're getting on. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, the journalist we met this morning. I think he'd be okay at point, wouldn't he? That's, that's and very um, good. it's been delightful stay for us. And we thank you very much for inviting us. And also to talk to you people. I hope we can chat to you informally. Yeah. There is a chance yeah. here for that. So over, a, over a drink in the cafe, indeed, perhaps. Indeed. Yes. That's the right mm. way to do it. Mm. Thank you again, and, and um, have a nice evening. Thank you.